Sponsored by Brilliant. Northrop Grumman needs a little help with their solid rocket motor program. And as an overconfident man with a YouTube channel, I think I'm the best person to help. It's a hard time to be a defense contractor with a $78 billion market cap and an endless appetite for guzzling up smaller businesses. So what can we learn from Northrop Grumman Innovation Systems' ability to innovate an exit cone free of a solid rocket motor while it continues to burn? 23 seconds into the second flight of Vulcan, one of the SRBs had a little hiccup and it ditched its nozzle extension. This looked a lot like the extension failure in 2019 from the Omega rocket booster test, which Northrop semi-accurately described as an observation. And at the very end, when the engine was tailing off, we observed the aft exit cone, maybe a portion of it, doing something a little strange. This is me when I do something a little strange. All rocket nozzles come in three sections, converging, throat, and diverging. This is a De Laval nozzle, and when the gas is converging, it's forced to speed up. You can think of this like putting your thumb over the end of a garden hose, which forces the liquid to flow out faster. Once the gas reaches the throat of the nozzle, it's forced to sonic speed, where physics changes a little bit. Once it's at supersonic speeds, any expansion is going to drop pressure further, but continue increasing velocity. This expansion section is what gets lost on Vulcan's recent flight. And if you can believe it, the flight seemed to work fine after. The first two sections of a De Laval nozzle, the converging section and the throat, are doing about 90% of the work of getting performance out of the rocket mode. Actually, that's not true. They're doing about 80% of the work. Let me show you. This is a program called Open Motor. It lets you simulate solid rocket grain geometry, thrust curves, pressures, and lots of other things. In this tab, I can set dimensions for the rocket nozzle. Right here, we have the rocket nozzle with the converging section, throat, and diverging section. You're looking at the simulation for the Simplex V2 motor that I fired earlier this year. According to the simulation, the total impulse delivered is about 42,000 newton seconds. But if I make some changes to the nozzle, we can effectively remove the exit cone. This drops the total impulse to 34,500 newton seconds. So the total impulse dropped by about 18%, which means the converging and throat of the nozzle do about 82% of the work. This very small increase in efficiency from the nozzle extension can also help explain why most solid rocket nozzles are conical exits and not parabolic. Looking at them here in on shape, a conical nozzle for this solid motor has a straight exit cone. There's no taper on the diverging section. But if we switch over to this liquid engine, for which I will provide no context and not explain what project it's for, you can see a very slight taper on the exit cone. And this is what I mean when I refer to it as a parabolic nozzle. It's generally a parabolic shape. A little bit of math tells us that a parabolic nozzle nozzle is always going to be a little more efficient than a conical nozzle. So why don't we see solid motors with parabolic nozzles? The answer is that we do kind of see them, but they're just pretty rare. The Gem 63 XL on the Vulcan uses a parabolic nozzle, but most things in amateur rocketry or even in professional aerospace, like the space shuttle boosters, use a conical nozzle. You know what? I'm not sure the SLS boosters have a conical nozzle. I feel like I can see a slight curve on the exit cone. If anyone knows if the SLS boosters are conical or slightly parabolic, let me know. The efficiency gain of a parabolic nozzle is not that significant. The nozzle extension at sea level is accounting for like 20% of the performance, and a parabolic nozzle is going to add single digits of performance onto that, so it's not that significant. The second is manufacturing, especially at the amateur scale. It is a lot easier to cut a straight taper than it is to cut a parabolic curve, especially if you're using a manual lathe with a DRO. It's just easier to go in a straight line. But the final and most important reason is the exhaust material itself. Solid propellant creates heavy biphasic exhaust. By this, I mean the exhaust is isn't purely a gas like you'd see coming out of a methylox or hydrolox engine. There are some solid particles in there too, like the aluminum oxides and some of the unburned AP particles. So in contrast to the relatively lightweight gas coming through a liquid rocket nozzle, solid rocket exhaust is heavier, which will strip away ablative materials faster. Since most solid rocket motors use ablative nozzles, this is a big concern. So all these things considered, I wanna put some numbers to this. How did Vulcan make it to orbit despite Northrop Grumman doing some innovation along the way? Some quick math tells us why this is like not a huge problem. I'm gonna use pounds because I understand them better, but I'll put metric on the screen too because sometimes people get unreasonably upset about that. Each BE-4 engine produces 550,000 pounds of thrust. Times two, it's 1.1 million. Each SRB at liftoff is providing about 400,000 pounds of thrust, and so all told the vehicle's producing just shy of two million pounds of thrust. So can you really lose one of these nozzles and be fine? 
Yeah, kinda. If both boosters are doing 400,000 pounds of thrust and one booster decides it's time to innovate, my guess is that innovation drops the thrust down to about 330,000 pounds of thrust. That's about a 17% cut on the thrust of one motor, but it's only a 4% cut across the total vehicle. This also assumes constant liquid and solid thrust, which is not the case across this whole flight profile. The Gem 63 XL uses a cylinder finicil geometry that is set up so the thrust curve is not at all flat. The other thing to note is that performance changes with temperature. These motors burn a little differently when it is warm versus when it is cold. Colder solid rocket motors burn more tame and more slowly, hotter solid rocket motors burn faster and more angry. This is by no means a conclusive analysis, but we can be pretty sure that the motors that are burning in October of 2024 are going to be burning harder and faster than the motors that were burning in January of 2024 during Vulcan's first flight. I did a bunch of math on the GNC side to see how bad this torque would have been. We have about a 70,000 pound deficit on the right side of the vehicle, which is why you see this thing pitch so hard once the exit cone leaves. I'll spare you all of the math I went through, but the TLDR is that that these Gem 63 XL motors having a three degree cant on the nozzle absolutely saved the flight. Without those solid boosters firing through the center of mass, the BE-4 five degree gimbal range would not have been enough to counteract a 70,000 pound deficit in one solid motor. Losing your nozzle extension is no good. The flight clearly worked, but it's worth using this as an opportunity to talk about planned failure modes. The best thing that can happen to your solid rocket motor is that it works, but the second best thing is that the nozzle falls out. There is no better failure mode than to poop out the nozzle. Think about it this way. You are now this solid rocket motor and you're feeling kind of goofy. What do you want to do? You could pop the forward closure, but that's no good. If you're attached to Vulcan, you're going to damage one of the tanks and take the whole vehicle out with you. And if you're firing on the test range in the desert, popping the forward closure means you push against your load cell and you fire the whole motor out like a bullet. That turns your static fire into a dynamic fire, which for reasons I shouldn't have to cover is not a great thing. If you're feeling goofy, you could also pop the case. This is a classic failure mode, a tale as old as time. Someone drops the rocket motor in processing and your GPS satellite becomes confetti. Oh. Anomaly. The only safe bet with solid rocket motors is to ditch the nozzle. In all of Northrop's GEM motors, which you can look at in the Propulsion Products catalog, which I love looking through, the case and the forward closure are wound together as one part, while the nozzle is always bolted on. This makes the motors safer to transport and bolt shear in a solid material like what looks like steel here is going to be a lot easier to FEA and calculate than shear out of a composite material. And composites are hard. Like, even if you're smart, they're hard. In amateur rocketry, this is just as true, just not as important. We're not flying national security missions, we're just like having a good time in the desert. Typically, a solid rocket motor is retained on both ends by radial bolts, and if you want to ensure the nozzle comes out, you need fewer radial bolts near the nozzle. Even if you're flying a high-power rocket stabilized by fins, the nozzle is still the best thing that can fail. If your nozzle falls out, the rocket won't go as high, but everything forward of the motor is safe. If you blow the case open, the fins are probably not staying on, your rocket's gonna turn sideways and likely and if you blow the forward closure, you'll do some impromptu stage separation while also probably killing other parts of the rocket. This video is drenched in sarcasm, so just to clearly state it, congratulations to ULA on getting Vulcan to orbit for a second time. It is genuinely impressive that it was able to suffer this type of anomaly and still make it. I thought this would be a great opportunity to talk about failure modes with a little more detail about nozzles. And I got a real slammer coming up soon too, so make sure you're subscribed. We're gonna look at X-rays inside of a solid rocket motor. But before we do that, I wanna thank the sponsor for today's video, which is Brilliant. If you don't already have the pleasure of knowing what Brilliant is, allow me to help you. Brilliant is an online interactive learning platform built around the idea of learning by doing. I say this every time, but I love working with Brilliant. For folks like myself and probably you, if you're interested in learning, Brilliant is a great service and way to do that. Learning by doing is the fastest and most effective way to gain a better understanding of something new. Brilliant specifically focuses on teaching math, data science, AI, programming, and fields of that nature. Maybe you're looking to switch career paths, or maybe you're looking to up your game and add some new skills to the skill tree. It's easy to do that on your budget and schedule with Brilliant, and they've even got a great mobile interface so you can learn on the go. From large language models to coding in Python to data science, you can get started for free for the first 30 days by going to brilliant.org slash BPS space. You can click the QR code or you can click the link in the description down below. I guess you don't click the QR code, you more scan it with a camera. Anyway, this will get you 20% off an annual premium subscription to Brilliant, which is a solid deal. Thanks a bunch to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Thank you 
to you for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds below. Goodbye.